Hi, I'm Mark Wybrow and this is a very special Electronic Cafe, the channel for the lovers of electronic music. And I'm Andy McNabb, so let's get started. So welcome to episode 20 of the Electronic Cafe. Uh, I have to say, we've had some great feedback from the first part of our interview with the legendary Rusty Egan. Trust me, part two is no different. And listen out for a very exclusive um, and very cool announcement from the great man himself. Then we're going to look at some new and very cool albums in our Hot Stuff section. Um, just as a heads up, look out for some mega episodes coming as we look at 1983 and its own showreel. Um, we're also going to ask the question, does Dave Gahan sound better when he's not in Depeche Mode? Controversial? Yup. And then at some point, uh, Mark and I are going to look at the, what we think are the greatest albums of 2020 just before Christmas. So loads of good stuff coming your way, courtesy of Mark, myself and our guests. And more importantly, some shit hot music coming from the Electronic Cafe. So keep watching. Right, let's get back to our interview with the legend that is Rusty Egan. Enjoy it. And as I said, look out for an exclusive announcement. As we know, Visage were a studio-only synth band heavily linked to the new romantic scene and the original lineup of Visage released just three albums between 1980 and 1984, Visage, The Anvil and Beat Boy. Visage consisted mainly of Steve Strange, Midgeur and Billy Curry from Ultravox, Rusty Egan, Dave Formula from Magazine, John McGeoch from Susie and the Banshees. As mentioned in part one, Rusty Egan is a drummer, musician, songwriter, DJ, producer, promoter. He's been a record label owner and a record shop owner. In the 1980s, he was the eye of the New Romantic Storm, almost single-handedly putting together the soundtrack to the New Romantic Movement, and he DJed at numerous legendary nightclubs, including Billy's, La Beat Brew and Blitz, which he ran with Steve Strange. Clearly, all of what Rusty has done would be far too much to discuss in one interview, so we thought we would concentrate on just one thing, the one thing that we have never really seen discussed in depth from one of the actual musicians involved. That one thing that we as fans or musicians would like to know the answers to, and that one thing is Visage. So here's part two, please enjoy. <laughs>
composition of drum machine and real drums or what did you use yeah, for those albums? Combination of both. Um I actually got um to try out my drum sound on Days in Europa. Oh, skids. With the skids. skids. Yeah. Recorded by Bill Nelson mm. in Rockfield Studios. In Studio Two was Dialect I Love You. Yeah I know that. And in Studio 3, rehearsing the songs, was Simple Minds with a left-handed drummer. I had no idea that the original drummer is left-handed. Um, so, me being Johnny Social, played my drums, not going back to London, go and eavesdrop and meet Merrick. Who's Merrick? Dialect I Love You, a drummer who went on to join and produce. Adam and Jens. He said, oh, I heard you've got a drum machine. Can we borrow it? And I was a bit like, that's my sound. You know what people are like. Yeah. I do know that when I went to London, Bill Nelson said, yeah, you can borrow it. <laughs> He's not here. You know, so bottom line, Dalek, I love you. You've got to nick my drum machine. As far as I know. Anyway, so I don't own the sound, do I? No. Anyway, um, Simple Minds were on to... Real to the Real Cacophony, I think. They gave me a special thanks on about Sons and Fascination, maybe. Anyway, the point of Big Fan of a that. track called uh, Film? Film yeah. Theme? Film yeah. Theme? Things from Great Cities. Film Theme. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, down, 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 down. It's just a little drum machine. Anyway, got chatting with them, chatting with a drummer, but he joins in as a drummer. I wouldn't have done that. It just goes bumped. Gap, bump, bump. It's really lovely, but big fan of Mick McNeil, big fan. Anyway, um, I suggested to them Kenny Hislop, who was playing with Midge, lived in Glasgow, and he joined them before they found Mel Gaynor. So I kind of made the suggestion. I would have loved to join them, but I had this thing called Visage. So anyway, my drum sound, very funny story. Um, Richard James Burgett brought me the equivalent of a motherboard with four uh, pieces of wire with a jack plug on each and a little, a little knob. So he said it's got uh, a crystallite pickup soldered to it, right? And you, on a long a long piece of wire and you can put that uh, anywhere you want and then you can hit something so I said well why don't we just put it inside my drum so we took the head off my drum unscrewed it all and every drum has got a, a sort of pad yeah so we stuck the crystallite pickup to it Put the head back on, put the cable out the little hole. So I had these wires going to here. And if you look on, if you look on uh, old grey whistle test, the skids, uh, I've got a box next to me and I'm twiddling the knob. But again, they, they mixed it down. I'm so upset about it. So the bottom line was, there's a couple of, oh, there's some sort of cracky sounds on skids and some there's some nice sounds which came from me hitting so it's my drum. It's triggering yeah. sound. Anyway, when I did the tour with the skids, I'm like in love with my. Oh, I had a I had a, a perspex box made with a neon light in it. 
profit fan with my controller because now I had the first SDS3, Dave Simmons SDS3. I had that in a box. I had the leads all going into my drum kit, but I turned them up too high and blown the crystallite pickup. So I phoned Dave Simmons. I said, listen, I've blown the crystallite pickup. He said, has the road crew got a soldering iron? So I went, let me find out. I call him back. Coin box. Bling. Bling. I'm in Scunthorpe. First night of the Skids tour. He goes, what you got to do is you've got to unscrew the mouthpiece of this phone and you've got to nick the crystallite pickup and you need three more. So I go running around all these phone boxes in the scuntle, unscrew it and take the crystallite thing out, run back to the gig and solder them on. And it worked. Of course it worked. That's how he made them. Out of these bone critter I pick up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you know, ahoy, ahoy, <laughs> let's see, let's try it. And then I could hit the rim shot and I had a foot pedal, I could turn it on or off. And I could do, um, <sighs> you know, <sighs> you know, that sound. Yeah, yeah. A bit like Yazoo, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, yeah, so I had this drum sound and I was trying to perfect the fade to grey, <laughs> you know. I wanted to end a song yeah. with that. So every night I'd be like getting a little magic marker out and marking where to put the length of the thing, you know. And I'd create all this, I could turn it on, I could turn it off with my foot. Yeah. I could do boom, that, boom, on, yeah. change the sound, you know. And for a joke, I could make the floor top go backwards. Boing, you know, like in the film. A reverse gate. Sort of yeah, thing. it could go, nice. and yeah. I could go, I could do like a back and timbre. So I really like the drum feel in Mind of a Toy. Oh yeah. yeah. Triggered, not played. Triggering, I learned. What happened was, um, Roland brought out a thing called the MT8 Micro Composer. And Richard Burgess is this kind of guy that could say, I want to review it for Technical Magazine, which he did. So he'd call me up and say, do you want to come over? I've got a Roland MC8 micro composer. And I'd be like, I'll be there. We were like nerds, right? You, know, you won't believe what I've got. I uh, was around his house. What can it do? Well, I haven't learned it yet. And there's a manual. It's like this. Okay, we're learning it. We're learning it. So I said to him, I've got this idea. What? I want to make a record with two drummers, but we don't play anything. What do you mean you don't play anything? I said, we tell the computer <coughs> what to do. Then we send it into the SDS3. So I want to bump, crack, bump, crack, to program that, it goes into the SDS3 and it goes kick, snare, kick, snare. I said, great, now we've got three toms, I want it to go whatever. So we end up boom, tap, boom, tap, I'm going to change the boom. So we change all the, then I want a bass line. So we program the bass line. Then I said, wouldn't it be amazing to do, because I'd heard Rock and Roll by Human League, wouldn't it be amazing to do the Gary Glitter type sound, but all on a computer? So I said, my favorite glitter band song is Angel Face. Yeah, Why don't we do Angel Face? So we get the song, listen to it, Intro, middle, late, chorus, da da da. That's what you right. Do shock, right? This... Yeah, but I found them later. Right. So basically, I've got this track. I'm doing. We're not. We're, the computer is playing it. We're not playing nothing. Angel Face 
by pressing play. And John Hudson, who made Angel Face, the original, who made Face Studios, put up the faders, and it just played. And the drums went everywhere, and the bass went everywhere, and chords came out. And he watched it all, like looking at a machine, all the faders work, all the bits work. We've done the whole arrangement. <coughs> so like doing it all at home and then plugging it in, yeah? And he went, you need the claps. And I went, yeah, but it's all done by a machine. He goes, wait a minute. He goes out and he comes back with two floorboards with some hand door handles. That's what he goes, this is how we did the glitter van. Wow. And he hit them like that. <laughs> and it was like this amazing sound. He said, let's put the claps on. first two albums were yeah. like you, Steve, Midge, Billy, yeah. Dave Formula. Yeah. The third album was pretty much, you was on it a little bit, but Steve Strange was on it. Was that just down to commitments and stuff, that people were doing other things for the third no. album? Or... Ultravox, don't forget, took off. That's right, that's what I mean. Ultravox was bigger than Desarge. It was down to commitments, really. Like, Ultravox was a real band. Yeah, yeah. The music industry didn't consider me and Steve Strange against Ultravox. Ultravox was a band. They toured, made albums. Mm. Not some blow who's out of a club every night, you know. <laughs> the way they looked at so, it. So it's commitment. And a bloody DJ. So it's commitment, commitment, really, because Ultravox were massive at the time. And no, but... Because you were still successful, even after the anvil. You were, you were still... This no, was still no, no. Good. What happened was the French bloke um, and I had now bought Trident Recording Studios and signed Soft Cell. And we had Matt Johnson, uh, Fetus, we had Steve-O in the office, we had Kevin Millions running uh, Final Solution, mates of uh, New Order and Pear Ubu and all this underground yellow. And, you know, we were me DJing, uh, Club for Heroes, hanging out with Craftwork. We were doing what we wanted to do and then walking back into Polydor with some bloke going, can you do another Visage album, please? And you're going, well, I'm really into this, I'm really into that. Yeah, but can you do another Visage album, please? So we were like, um, well, it kind of isn't a Visage at the moment. Uh, it's just me and Steve. And you didn't do anything for Pleasure Boys, which, by the way, is bootlegged in New York and one of the biggest hip hop records on the dance scene. Keep yourself in my position, think about it every day. Give me side effects, I wanna hear the words, I wanna hear what you have to say. You know, my situation. During which time I've just had a hit record with Africa Bambata and hip hop and electronic music. Yeah. And I'm really into, and you know, yellow. And they're like, yes, but we want a Visage album. And if you can't deliver it, next, you know. So our relationship with Polydor sucked from the beginning. Yeah. Um, if your record company doesn't like you, you're not going anywhere. No, no. And if you have got 1,500 people queuing up to go into your nightclub, you don't give a fuck about your record company. Yeah, that's true. And then you're booking Blamonge on stage and your Rhythmics on stage and Frank goes to Hollywood on stage and Madonna on stage and you've got to talk to some fucking bloke in a record company who doesn't even know what you're fucking doing. You're just like, fuck off. That's the way I look at it. No, you're right. That's the way. Get your fucking luncheon vouchers and go for lunch. Yeah? 
Do you know, there's this story about Eric Clapton that went to see the chairman of a record company who took a phone call and kept Eric Clapton waiting for 20 minutes and spun his chair around and left Eric Clapton sitting there. And Eric Clapton said, as long as you're the chairman of this fucking record company, I'm not going to make another record. <laughs> Show me some fucking respect. And that's the way I look at the record companies today. Prince, slave, George Michael, older. You fucking do what we tell you to do. Stop hanging around with faggots, said Tommy Matola. We Mike? own your ass. Record companies in those days owned your ass. Mm. And I fucking hated them. As far as I'm concerned, I could put 1,500 people into a club. I could go, Frankie goes to Hollywood, are going to be massive. <laughs> really? <laughs> they hadn't even got a record deal. You go, don't need a record deal to know if they're massive, mate. Exactly. Uh, and this record I'm playing now, Yellow, it's going to be, not going to be a hit. But it bloody means something. And Bill Laswell, material. I signed Bill Laswell. The next song he did was Herbie Hancock, Rocket. And then he produced and co-wrote Rise for Pill. And uh, yeah, he's just some bass player. Fuck off some bass player. He's bloody genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Youth. Youth from Killing Joker put his band on called Brilliant. You know, I mean, yeah. all the people that I was loving, Kurt Brandon... Still here today making music. Mark Armand, all these left-wing sort of arty artists that I loved. All the, I made the Batcave album and the Specimen and, mm. you know, all that. I don't... Today I'm an old man. But, but you know, you've got a pile of vinyl here. You've got albums that you made by people who put their life and soul into them. Yeah. Their product to some bloke... They're a, a serial number. Not to you and me, they're not. No, of course not. They're, they're, they're the Bible to you and me. We put on a Joy Division album. What, what did they have? What did, what did they have? They had nothing. You know, in the darkest old room of Manchester in a warehouse. Bloody nothing. It's they true. had one bloke called Tony Wilson who believed in them. In a Martin yeah, Hannett. For Tony Wilson and Martin, Martin Hannett. Yeah. You yeah. know, and they believed and they made that music. Mm. I'm sorry, but I get all emotional because I love what I do and I love the artist. I mean, uh, I could tell you about Billy McKenzie crying, been dropped, you know, fucking killed himself. Um, the most amazing artist. Great voice. You so know, sure. next. Yeah. Neck, the music in his neck, all those poor people that go on talent shows that have their dream ruined. Next, you know, so I'm like, I'm not a music mogul, you know, I should be, but I've never had that, you know, Def Jam Records, whatever his name is, you know. I was in New York in 1980. I was there with Africa Bambara. I was there with the scratching and the hip hop and making the hip hop a TR808 drum machine shit. I've never been Tommy Boy Records who went on to become multi billionaire, blah, blah, blah. I've never been that kind of bloke. But Daniel Miller's worth 50 million quid. If you met him, he's the nicest, normalest, yeah. music loving he's, he's, person ever. He's an example of You know, there's not a cigar chomping music mogul. You know, and yeah. that's sort of my... Ex I left the music business in 1989. I was yeah. like, fuck off. You know. Lose myself in glassy pages Dull magazines Moments pass by Oh, so slowly Makes me laugh Like a Tony Wilson, though, because you've got, yes. you got a passion. But for I am. No, but you've got a passion for finding <coughs> talent, and you've got the ear irrespect for it. and the ear for it, irrespective of whether it's dollars or unit sales or whatever. You've got this knack of finding artists or songs. Yeah, but and you would would any corporation <clears throat> put me in a boardroom? No. I'd love to see it, though. At the end of the day, we made these albums. We made them because we loved the music. I love it. Um, we were never going to be a band on the road in tour. 
Midge Ewer is still godfather of my son. I'm the worst godfather of his youngest daughter. Sorry. Um, I try. Send her a message every now. Hello. <laughs> Happy birthday. Anyway, the point is, I think you do that. You make the music, you leave it there. And I tweeted the other day. <clears throat> as far as I know, my ears are never wrong. I don't read anything. You send me some music and go, well, you recorded it there on that drum machine using that keyboard player who was in a band that once made a record with a bloke that was called him that did that, did the other, on that record label in this studio. And I go, OK, play. Ugh. But sometimes in what you would call badly recorded or not very well presented, there's still something great. Sometimes you go, what is it? Yeah. It fucking sounds terrible. There's something about it. I don't know what it is. You know, what if they recorded it properly? No, you'd ruin it. This is great. And you listen to it ten oh, times. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you close. listen to it ten times and you go, it's great. I love it. Great. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's like, what is it? It's the jam. That's entertainment. They try to re-record, re-record the demo and it never, it never sounded as good as the demo, which is something yeah. just a simple... Like the Martin Hannett version of The Light Pours Out of Me. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. Start, suddenly hear another version. Yeah. yeah. Even the, the, the Dancer by Visage, the demo, is on the album. Paid for Visage. Why don't you get paid for Visage? Well, because da, 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 da. exactly. So the system is not paying a hell of a lot of people what they should be getting. So what I want to end with is 1920 to 2020 is 100 years the recorded music industry has been established. Hasn't changed. Philips was 100 years old. They made cameras, DVD players, whatever they made, nobody buys anymore. It doesn't matter, they're 100 years old. It's over. Sony took over. Yamaha took over. Samsung will take over. Somebody can make the hardware. We're making the content. We have to own the content. And if we don't own the content, we own nothing. Yeah. But if they don't own the content, they own nothing. Yeah. So there must be a new way for the content owner to own it. Now, no record company had anything to do with anything to make this what they call product. The sleeve, we did it. The recordings, we did it. The video, we did it. The logo, the name, the artwork, oh, you guys. we did it. The 12 inch mix, we did it. Make the video, the music promo department, we did it. We did it all. Craftwork did it all. Depeche Mode and Daniel Miller did it all. All we need from you is digital distribution. And anyone can do that, including CD Baby. Anyone can upload to all the platforms your music and get them everywhere. What they can't do is get them through, don't forget it, the internet is not the future. The internet is over. What do you mean the internet is over? The internet is over. The control of the internet, the ownership of the internet is over. We've got now point three, is it coming? Uh, 3.0, yeah. 3.0 is coming, and we've got SpaceX. You'll be able to get hold of a song in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and your mobile phone will work. There are 1.5 billion Chinese people who are going to have a phone. There is Russian people. There is Eastern European. The world is 50 times.
bigger than it was when the Beatles made a record. So if you're 18 years old and you are John Lennon, your world is yours. Do not sign away your rights. Own everything. And that I've got to leave you no, with. Loudmouth. I'm a loudmouth. I'm called a whistleblower, just like Julian Assange and just like the other bloke, Snowden. I'm the whistleblower of the music business because I've been ripped off. Well, you haven't been ripped off. You were just signed the wrong deal. Really? The same deal that David Bowie had, the same deal that every other artist yeah. that will tell you I was ripped off? 100 years. There are people that wrote songs that Led Zeppelin stole. They were paid 50 bucks on a porch of a Mississippi yeah, three chords, right? They sold that for life of copyright. Life. When I signed Soft Cell, 25 years. What do you mean 25 years? 25 years. You're crazy. They get their copy back right back after 25 years. And Steve Strange and me. That's what I do. I don't sign anyone for a life. It's wrong. It's You're an wrong. idiot. Well, I'm only giving them 20 grand. But I believe in them. Yeah, but you could own them for life. Yeah, I know I can. But that's not what I'm here. I'm here because I believe in them and I want them to make music. And they've done it. And they got their copyright back. I got my copyright back on the pieces of the music that I wrote. Yeah. Not on the recording. I know I shout a lot, but I believe you guys and the Electronic Cafe are passionate about music. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, mate. And you can't okay. fault your passion. It's unbelievable. Okay. We, we get it. We get well, it. Totally get it. people, I always tell a bloke in a record company, do you remember when you were 17 and he looked in a shop window and you saw something that you were going to save up for? for yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe at Christmas it got bought for you on a catalogue and they had to pay for it for five years every <laughs> bloody week, right? Well, what happened? Now that you've got millions in the bank and what happened? Where, where's your starry-eyed view? Well, you know, where is Everything's the passion? Yeah. When you held an album and you held it and you opened it and you, you held it like that and you turned it over and... <laughs> You blew it and you polished it and where's your I think love? That, that explains why vinyl was my yeah. to have come. Where's your love? You're like swipe left, swipe left. You have no you know, when I write a song I don't I don't sit there, imagine there's no heaven. Nah, that's not catchy. I'm not gonna make any money out of that. You know, oh, what about if I write all? Oh. You know You get what I mean? There are people, believe you me, there are people who write to order. Can you write a song for Justin Bieber? Yeah, yeah, we've... That, we've That's their yeah, job. Yeah, Full-time job. Mate. Yeah, you were 12 and I was 13. I saw you across the car. Yeah, you caught my eye and I caught yours. You know, I mean... Yeah, yeah but it's really good for 12-year-old people who really relate to that kind of music. And, da, 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 and it's got a hook. You know, what is the hook? They go, oh, oh, you know how it does. Yeah, oh, oh. Yeah, great. Rusty, mate, honestly. I'll... Cheers, Rusty. Been amazing. there before, haven't we? Amazing, amazing. Oh, it's such a shame. Nothing's true. What's happening now? So, we planned that Midge and I would do a 1980 Visage Vienna uh, celebration, 40 years, and Midge has got a band, and I don't really need me. And I said, yeah, but 
I want Dave Formula, you know, Barry Adamson, yeah, da, da, yeah. Da, da. and the bottom line was they didn't want to do it. And Midge said, look, why don't you just come on the road with me? And I went, yeah, but you've got a drummer and it's your gig and I really appreciate it. He said, no, no, you've got to be there. Well, why don't I just sing a bit and play some drums on the songs that we wrote and then piss off? So he said, I'll tell you what, why don't you just DJ for half an hour? So Bob lines, I turned up at the first gig, Norwich, and I opened the curtain and I run backstage and go, Midge, they haven't been to a nightclub for 30 years. <laughs> they're all sitting down. It's a theatre. The last thing they want to do is dance and they're not allowed to dance. He said, what are you saying? I said, well, I'm not shy, am I? Why don't I just put a record on and talk about it? He goes, yeah, get them in the mood. So I come out. First gig, and I go, for the 80% of the audience who don't know who I am, my name's Rusty Egan, and I was in a band with Mijur, and they all clap when they hear his name. And I said, we split up, because we got gobbed on. <laughs> <laughs> we hated it, and then we started a band called Vitar. So yeah, to bottom line, I told her these funny stories. But we saw it, I played it. Yeah. yeah. We saw it, played it, and that was really good. That could have gone on for long People enough, loved it, but they said half an hour, I talk too much, that bloke, half an hour. I could have gone on forever, yeah. So the bottom line was, I even went three minutes over at the Palladium. Like, eh, all hell broke loose. All <laughs> hell broke loose. Three minutes over, and I go, oh. Anyway, so the bottom line was, I thought, well, I'll do a couple of audiences with Rusty's. So I did a few audiences with, with Rusty, and I talked about Yellow Pearl, uh, Madonna, all the other things that nobody knew that I did. And uh, the bottom line was, people really enjoyed it. So I started to say, well, I don't need to. DJ in nightclubs with people asking for Rihanna, I might do, do an audience with. So then, Midge and I had a conversation about the Anvil and Visage and the next tour, and he said, well, I'm going to New Zealand. And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, Zane Griff lives in New Zealand. And I said, oh, wow, yeah, Zane. I went to his gig in London recently. He was great. And he goes, why don't you get Zane and Chris Payne and perform the music of two, these two albums? So I went, what about you? He said, well, I'll do Visage Vienna with my band and you do them, the Visage it's with your amazing. band. Amazing, yeah. So I go, well, I need another keyboard player. So I call up Dave Formula. And Dave's like, Rusty, I'm 70 years old. <laughs> yeah. I've got my own recording studio. I just walk round the corner. I go to lunch and I make music and I'm really happy. You want me to go around the world for how much? I go, oh, all right. And then I send a message to Barry Adamson and he's like, I want me solo album number eight, you know. So I'm like, so Chris says, well, what about um, David Brooks? I said, who's he? He's been with Gary for 25 years. I said, two Newman keyboard players? Well, how can I beat that? I thought, I've got to have that. So then I get hold of Brian Tench. Who's Brian Tench? Well, he's the sound engineer on both albums. He recorded them. And he did Kate Bush running up that hill. And he did OMD. A pretty good CV. Yeah, I mean, I went, Brian. So Brian's like, well, the way it works, Rusty, is everybody makes the pieces in their own studio. I went, all oh, right. So I do, yeah. And Chris is in France and said, okay. So the bottom line is, Dave Formula said, well, I'll make my piano and I'll send it to you. So I thought, well, why don't I re-record them? Yeah, but who's going to sing? I said, Zane Griff. Nobody knows who he is. I said, good. Why? Because we're not Visage. We're Rusty Eager Presents Visage. The DJ. David Getter, who's he? He's a DJ. He don't sing, he don't play nothing, he don't write nothing. But he had number one records all over the world. Yeah. Okay, well I'm a DJ. I write and I produce and I play. And if you listen to Welcome to the Remix Volume 2, 
there ain't no keyboard players in there. There's me and my son. We do it. Except if the band or the artist sent me something. So the bottom line is, I phone them up and say, can you give me a bit of a piano? That's how it works today. I love it. Mitch Ure has got a studio in his house. Yeah. So when I go do Glorious, he says, send it to me. Then he sends it back and there's his guitar. And then I mix it. So, what we decided to do was revisit it. Now, the love and the passion that we put into these albums, I'm definitely putting into Revisited. But I kind of thought, well, I want to perform it live too. Now, I'm a drummer. If you go... 138 BPM. Then you want to go... Um, then you want to say... Um, Look what they done to me. Right? And then you go, oh, Mal Paso man, do, do, oh, moon over Moscow, um, you know, visage. Oh, bla oh, oh, bla Bloody hell. Blocks on block. It's so fast. So I thought, blocks on blocks to roll around, neo and sound and sound. So I kind of slowed them down like 20%, yeah. not like 50%, like 20%. And it sounds so much Big cooler. Yeah. You know, we were all young, it's like, you know what I mean? I slowed them down a bit. And, uh, and I feel much happier. So what I've done is with, um, look what they've done to me, I can see, I've added like a 32 bar build up. And I've done the same for Damn Don't Cry. I've built it. So I thought, yeah, I want the album. I want to hear the song. I don't want the same album, do I? I don't want to copy. It's called mm. Revisited, right? And it means it's different. But then I thought, I can't get Barry Adamson. I'll get Chris Cross from Amazing. Ultravox. Yeah. And he said yes. And I thought, well, I'll get Gary Barnacle, who's the sax player on Night Train, and he's the sax player on... Um, uh, but John McGee is the sax player on uh, The Dancer. So I started to go... I couldn't even get a guest singer if I wanted. So... The idea of Revisited is evolving in five different studios while we're all locked down. So basically, most weeks I get a piece of music and I click on it and go, oh my God, this is amazing, Chris has done that, and oh, David Brooks has done that, you know. So I'm really into putting them together. And then so I when, thought I wanted to do it on vinyl. When do you think that's going to come out? Well, I've got possibly a year to write another album, remake two albums. It's the third album could be under the Visage brand as well. All three of them, 40 year anniversary, and a booklet in great detail about who's on what, who played what, what instrument, how we did it. Um, and I thought, this lockdown, let's say 2021's a washout. Let's just say, right? Yeah, which it could be. What am I going to do at home? I'm just going to perfect it. Whereas the third album by Visage, the one that dived, right? If you listen to the actual songs, which I heard by accident the other day when somebody sent me a radio thing, I thought, that's, that's, that's quite a good song. Just that it's a bit bit crackly done, yeah. could have been done better, you know. So then I started thinking, well, if I'm locked down even more, I'm going to remake them. I started to think, you might as well. I mean, questions, more questions, da, 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 da. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was a beautiful song in that basin. So I started to sort of say, why don't I just revisit it and get it all done? Um, now, it's not like, I know I'm very loads of money. It's not really. If I sold 1,000 copies on vinyl, I'm happy. Everyone made it at home. 
everyone, no one had said to me how much. So that's why I'm into the blockchain thing. So basically we'll all share whatever. And then we'll perform it live. Who's we? Chris Payne, Chris, David Brooks. Might, I don't think, um, I don't think Chris Cross wants to go on the road. Uh, and me and uh, Dane Griff. Uh, if you don't know who Zane Griff is, just go on to YouTube. He did a beautiful version of Ultravox Passionate Reply. Yeah. Ashes he and did Diamonds. an album with Tony Visconti. Ashes and Diamonds. Uh, Ashes and Diamonds. A um, lot of people in the 80s said, oh, Bit Bowie, Bit Bowie. David, um, Tony Visconti, look, Bit Bowie. Russ Egan in the video with Gary Tibbs. But he then made a band with Warren Can uh, called Heldon. Yeah, he worked with Ronnie, he worked with Zane Griff, Zane Griff worked with Hans Zimmer, and bottom line was, he went back to New Zealand. Um, which is brilliant, because he didn't do a load of crap. I want to take you in my arms and squeeze the living daylights out of you, my dear. In spite of our differences, so soon you come again. Um, you know when 80s bands went through the, we wish, the ultra bop that should never have happened, the Steve Strange visage of 2002. No, uh, to be quite yeah. suspect, Gary Newman went through that really bad. Did Gary Newman do that? Yeah, he went through that really bad pack, didn't he? So yeah, he had a bad pack. Yeah, like yeah. mid 80s, and we talked about it in one of our episodes, because we love Newman, you know. Yeah. He's, 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 come, he's come back full so circle. And now my like, beat boy was my bad patch. And I knocked you on the head. <coughs> you know. Um, yeah, so basically to end this uh, about that, I'm at home, home studio. Uh, I do have a couple of other projects. Something with Boy George, something with Anne Clark, something... Um, uh, Soundtracky film, soundtracky, but no, this is my number one priority. But because of COVID, because we're all at home, out of bad comes good. And in 2030, when you put on Visage Revisited, and there's a sort of 70 year old man there, you might be able to say, I hope that was great. I still listen to that now. I remember the old album, but the new one, I loved it. And then I found your Welcome to the Dance Floor, and then I found Tony Hadley and Peter Hook. And like, this might actually open the floodgates to the last 10 years of music that not many people have listened to, yeah. but only certain people, which I think is a great body of work. So I don't know. What else am I going to do? Yeah. What? What so else those, those, those three albums you get redoing, the revisiting ones, are you going to release those individually or a box set or a... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that stuff comes later. What I mean is I make the music. Yeah, that's right. And then my art design guys will give me these options. I don't do prima donna stuff. I don't go, oh, it's not the right quality. I know 180 grand vinyl. I know what the cover should be. I know what I want to deliver. Yeah. And if they go, yeah, but it's going to cost you an extra pound, I'll go, then I lose a pound. Yeah. I'm not making this album to make one pound and have it in a crappy sleeve and not the right vinyl. I'd rather make 500 vinyl yeah, exactly. box set. That's it. If I can't make a pound, then I'll make 500 quality then. Exactly. So I'm hoping that this is, this is my career for the next five years. An audience with Russell Egan, if anybody actually wants to hear me talking about the decade up to 1990 and then 2010 to now, the 20 years in between, the bad period, the dark stuff. Where's my money? <laughs> what do you mean you ripped me off? Um, uh, I, I don't think I should go there. And I don't think people want to hear that, personally speaking. Although, 
Peter Hook to master at it, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> his books are just like he's having a conversation with you. So <laughs> Amazing. Like <clears throat> Amazing. So, yeah, this is what I hope. Somebody might put a prick in this. Rusty, wake up, mate. Music business, it's all about streaming. Nobody cares about vinyl. Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares. And then I say, okay, well, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't take drugs. I don't drive a car. I don't have a, lo a loan. I don't borrow money. I don't have sugar in my tea. I don't need anything. Why don't we just call this a labour of love? I don't want a dog and go for a walk and sit with me mate down the pub and talk about the good old days. I want to continue to make, write, produce music that I love. Yep. And that's what I'm going to do. Good for you, mate. Here, here. So, just to recap, amazing exclusive here, guys. These two albums are going to be reworked. And then the third album of all new material. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, we've got... Amazing. amazing. The lineup I just told you about, yep. <clears throat> and I'm writing songs. Now, when I say I'm writing songs, I write lyrics, top line melodies, but I can only write them when the chords arrive. And when Chris or David or Zane send me something, you've got something to work on. Yeah. If somebody sent you, mm, mm, uh, mm, mm, uh, you go, wow, <laughs> you're in heaven, aren't you? You know what I mean? And then you put your bit to it. So. I'm like that. Um, cool. The last song I wrote all on my own, I got um, I signed B Movie, Nowhere Girl, and Paul Stradham, uh, he sent me a piece of music. And I was out in Ibiza with Steve Norman, and I said, Tonight's the night, the music's calling. We danced to Iggy, Ferry, and Bolan, and hey, we found love when we were young. I said, it's crap, said Steve Norman. I said, no, it's about a night at the Blitz. Yeah. You know, it's Tuesday night and we're ready for some fun. Oh, yeah. He went, nah, it's rubbish. It kind of put me off. So anyway, I did it all sounds, on my own. Sounds a good track, I think. And um, okay. they're doing this documentary at the moment, working title www.getblitzed.co.uk Password Synth Pop 2. And you see a video and you three dudes in it. So anyway, um, I said, I've got the perfect song. <laughs> and I've Sound. remade it and I put it on my SoundCloud. And basically I cut out 1984, 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, actually 7. Because then it was the summer of love. So basically I do this basically a bit about 1979 to 1984. Uh, and that's what that track is called when we were young. And I think it's perfect for Get Blitz. Yeah. And I hope they use it. Yeah. Today's fanciful, ultra-glamorous, gender-bending style isn't as today as you might think. England 1979. Punks. Drab grey streets, unemployment, violence, strikes and recession. But it was all about to get a serious makeover that changed things forever. Amongst the squalor, some musical vanguards were making waves, new waves. The seeds of a new movement had just been sown. Enter Rusty Egan. I thought, this is working. This music's working. People dance to it. Enter Steve Strange. Wherever they're looking, they've got to have a look to get through the door. And a few others from St Martin's School of Arts. Kings Road trendsetters and suburban kids who had had enough of beer-soaked rebels. Style was it, and the vibes sealed the deal. That was rusty. These were underground records. Magazine, Ultravox, Kraftwerk, Neu, Kang, Le Dusseldorf. Nobody knew what the music was, but they loved it. The Blitz kids were the new revolution. The revolution that not only shaped the 80s, but shaped our here and our now. Sex and drugs and rock and roll was out. It was synth, sexuality and style. 
Well, maybe some drugs too. Boys could be girls and girls could be boys and keyboards and turntables were king. And it all came out after dark. It was the age of the new romantics. You know them. Visage, Ultrabox, Spandau, Soft Cell, Duran, Duran, Depeche Mode, an MTV bust in, and video utterly killed the radio star. Now there were video stars. Do you really want to hurt me? Do you really want to make me cry? Do and they were really all on to something. And some were even on to each other. The scene was set. A family was born, whose progeny we still listen to today. Q Daft Punk, Moby, LaRue, churches. Today the 80s is alive and kicking and everything from the music we listen to, to the fashion we wear, to the sexuality we express. This is a story of style, music and morality and it's a story that's not been told. And now you can see exactly how we got here and you don't need to come out after dark. So, Become by Majeure is massive. You look at it on YouTube, million plays and all that, right? And I thought it was all right, right? So, I wrote a chorus and I sent it to Mitch. So I said, look, Mitch, I've written this chorus. And Mitch says, it's good, but it's not right. <laughs> and he wrote a chorus for it. And I got upset because I thought, well, he's just... Just said my chorus is crap. <laughs> so when Steve said I own Visage, legally I own Visage, and I'm gonna make a Visage album without you. So I said, Well you can't sing, you got no fucking songs. <laughs> fucking do it. And then we sent a, 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 a letter to his manager and said, You can't have become, you can't have dreamer, and you can't have evermore. And he wrote back and said, But Mitch has released become. What? <laughs> Midge had released become. He put it online or something. And legally, you know, legally, he's gone public and under the law. And, all, you know, it's like that. Yeah. I said, OK, you can't even write a song. You have to steal one. Anyway, cut along story sideways. I've written in my heart, in my soul, in my dreams. Yeah? Love is coming my way. And I'd written that for become, instead of become, become. Yeah. So I sent become to Midge, minus him, right? So I pulled out everything to do with him. And I put the beat in and I played the bass line. And then I wrote, um, Love is Coming My Way. And Midge, God bless him, said, well, that's your song. I said, yeah, but Midge, I wrote it on your chords for become. He said, Rusty, you took me out. That's decent. I don't it? own chords. That's decent. How wonderful is that? Yeah, that's actually really decent. Yeah. yeah. You know they say where there's a hit, there's a rip. Yeah. But that's when people go, yeah, but you took, you, you copied it and you go, hang about. It's like you that guy who told you about his drum machine. Yeah, you took my like drum sound. You go, what, I programmed the drum machine and it sounded like your drum machine. Yeah, right, well, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. So anyway, um, the point... The point was, Mitch gave me back that song. So, love is coming my way, you know, bum, 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 bum. So I got more confidence that my crappy songs yeah. might, might be yeah. quite good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I've got a new song, and I sent it to Chris, and he wrote back how crap it was, right? <laughs> and he, he more, you know, he said, Rusty, please, Zane has got a great idea. Your idea is really crap. You know, he wrote like that, right? But, but he, 
he does it every time, right? He did it with Glorious and everything, you know what I mean? He does it every time, right? So anyway, it just makes me want to run him back, you know what I mean? And, and basically, I go, think of the Corgis, you know? Yeah. You know, because I'm singing it, you see? The bit that he doesn't understand is if somebody goes, change your heart. Yeah. Look around you. It won't be if you hear that, right, you go, oh my God, right? Yeah, dun, 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 right? I mean, I wrote blocks on blocks, you know, you want, you want to hear me, I'm rubbish. But when I go, no, get, get him to sing it, so yeah. when I get someone to sing it. Yeah. And the point is, really, songwriting, uh, for me, I've always been a songwriter, but I never knew I was a songwriter. I was more of an arranger. A producer. Yeah, yeah. I don't sit with a guitar, you know, but if you give me an instrumental piece of music, I'm sitting there going, oh my God. Take strength from my connection. I'm trying to say, look at Sinead O'Connor, mm. and you look at her eyes, and when she sings, you know, it's been seven hours yeah, yeah. and fifteen There's days a lot of soul in those eyes. since you took my love yeah. away. Yeah. You know, I eat my dinner too. every night in a fancy <laughs> restaurant, and you think, what a terrible line. You know what I mean? It's the delivery, isn't it? The delivery, and I have to say, Chris, I know it sounds cheesy, but think of Sinead O'Connor singing that now. Think, think of that, you know what I mean? And when I hear Sinead O'Connor with Simple Minds in Belfast Child, mm -hmm. she only has one verse. But it works. <laughs> huh? But it works. Ah, and you go, oh my God, that voice. So that's kind of what's in my head. But what comes out of my throat <laughs> is Del Boy. Yeah, you know? certain, certain. And that's basically what he's here. He's like, I don't know what you're trying to do, bro. I'm trying to get that. And I hope we get it. I okay. hope we get it and it'll be on Rusty Eaton Pretend Visage. Brilliant. Brilliant. Rusty, mate, thank you so much. This is the longest interview ever for a 30 minute show. Yes. We've been here for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not getting out. <laughs> but Rusty, thank you, mate. And look, guys, we'll keep you posted on developments of those projects so you guys get to hear and see it first. So a uh, big thank you to our guest, Rusty Egan. Cheers. Take care. Thank you. So welcome to our Hot Stuff section where Mark, myself and sometimes we have guests come and talk about albums that they're loving that are quite fresh uh, and freshly released or albums that have graced their turntables over the years and just feel they need to tell uh, subscribers all about them. This particular album, uh, Working Men's Club, is no exception. It's headed by a guy called Sid Minsky Sargent. Um, they were began something that apparently you know some of the early stuff sounds something like early Joy Division, and they've really kind of become this crack rock techno beast. Um, and um, they've got a new lineup, so there's uh, members of Drenge and Moon Landing um, come together to create this self-titled album. Um, and I think this is something that actually um, the guy Sid Minsky Sargent has been wanting to do all along. And I have to say, it's thrilling. It's almost like the difference between 1981 New Order and 1989 New Order. I think it's, when you listen to this, it's got, it's packed with gurgling, yelping energy, really powerful synths, great bass and drum beats. I think for some people, it'd be easy to um, kind of lump them in with the litany of other bands with the chaotic, chaotic live energy. And they're, they're obviously inspired by the fall, um, but I think they're trying to make their own mark um, and I, I'd say, you know, it, it just hits the spot with bits of fag gadget, new order, the fall, um, but all with a great groove thrown into it. Um, and I'd say, will this feature in our top albums of 2020? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. But whereabouts in that chart? Stand by at the end of the year to check that show out. But in the meantime, grab yourself an earful of this album. It is brilliant i absolutely love it it just reminds me of the clubs i went to as a kid discovering some of the cool bands that we all love now it brings back all those memories but in a fresh exciting very energetic way and so this is working men's club 
Um, if you go on to resident records, you can get uh, limited neon vinyl signed copies. Uh, uh, they're selling quite quickly, but if you uh, get onto their site now, you probably grab yourself a nice copy. So definitely check this out. I absolutely love it. I say, Working Men's Club, let me know what you think. And you're my sunshine, suicide, break my mind You're my sunshine, suicide, break my mind You're my sunshine, suicide, break my mind my second album in our Hot Stuff section, unusually for me, Mark's far better at finding the, the sort of gems from the past, but for, for once I'm actually going to do one, I'm going to go back 13 years, because I've only really just discovered these guys. Um, for some of you, they might be shocked at that, um, but they're called Data Rock. Um, this is a really cool album, again on resident records from their record store day in Brighton, so really love this these, these guys at um, the shop. So if you want to get a copy of this in orange vinyl, Go on their website now, um, definitely worth trying to get a copy. They're a dynamic tracksuit loving duo from, from Bergen in Norway. Um, that's a seaside town I found out that's ridiculously, it has a vibrant scene that spawned Annie, Roy Xop, Erlendoy, and countless others. They're really inspired by the electro pop sounds filling their local clubs. Uh, and I'd say be prepared for a full frontal electro camp assault with some very David Burnett gangly guitar lines and slick synth led production styles. There's an opener called Bulldozer that kind of kicks things off of the track, dedicates the Bears massive affection for BMXing, uh, which they loudly proclaim to be better than sex. I'll let them kick that one to themselves. Um, then there's the twisted corn response to Computer Camp Love, which harks back to a time when the power ballad reigned supreme. There's a track called, and there's a video on YouTube worth checking out called Far, Far, Far. It's kind of them, the data rock at their infectious best. Mixes sort of dance rock drums with sort of funky strung guitars and a very, very catchy chorus. And again, massive influences of David Burnley talking heads in that in this that track, which is no bad thing in my book. Um, and he makes a guest appearance on the final cruise and track, We'll Always Remember You. It kind of reveals the silky quality of the singer Fred's voice and conjures up, I think, images of spring days, courting couples, and super smooth vodka. Um, the standout track is the least overtly funny, and gives a glimpse of the emotion behind all that kitsch that they put on the rest of this album. The Most Beautiful Girl. Uh, it goes down a slightly more somber path with a very good cool melody and tear-stained lyrics, and it's obviously inspired by a painful breakup. Um, so there you have it. I think Data Rock are l lunatics who occasionally border on genies. Or perhaps it could be the other way around. I'll let you decide that. The only thing is for sure, your life would be greyer without this album. Um, I'd say buy it now if you can. Um, i say limited copies are available on uh, in Resident Records' website. Um, I know it's two plugs for Resident, but they seem to be supplying a good load of albums lately. Um, and so a good bunch down in Brighton. So uh, yeah, if you want to grab a copy of this, go onto their site. But i say more importantly, Give this a listen. Um, it's a very cool album. Uh, love it to bits. If you want to wear me the shame, I need a brand new mission. Because I'm on a red first, going nowhere. And I left my brand new first, I'm on the road. My first Hot Stuff recommendation is Revelations by Daphne Guinness, released in August 2020. Ever since the vast success of the likes of Adele and Ed Sheeran, rock stars and pop stars have sold themselves on being men and women of the people, relatable and flawed. With Daphne Guinness there's no such pretense. Daphne Guinness is an English socialite, musician and fashion designer and she is a direct descendant of the 18th century Irish brewer Arthur Guinness. In 1985 when she moved to New York City she got to know Andy Warhol and in fact her sister was Andy Warhol's personal assistant for many years. She was a friend of David Bowie who encouraged her and introduced her music to Tony Visconti who concurrently produced her first album along with David Bowie's Black Star. Tony Visconti also produces this album Revelations, her third album which is an eclectic mix of hard driving electronic disco full of Visconti's brilliant lush flush orchestrations. The album is infused with a modern mix of post disco meets revived glam rock 
and it reminds me a lot in places of the Pet Shop Boys. Beautifully produced and as you would imagine from someone immersed into the world of fashion and design, Revelations features amazing artwork including three full colour booklets with mind blowing art. The album really is worth checking out and how wrong can anything be if it is recommended by David Bowie and is produced by Tony Visconti. My second Hot Stuff album selection is an album called Grayscale by the band Camouflage. Camouflage are a German synth trio formed in 1983 and have had eight albums, with this one, Grayscale, being their eighth album released in 2015. It was their first studio album released in nine years. Grayscale reflects the best of the group's dark signature sound while also updating it and giving it a contemporary spin. It's a synthesizer dominated, well textured music, it's full of keyboard, it's full of melodies. Over the course of their career, Camouflage have, at times, sounded like the best moments of Depeche Mode, the Human League, OMD or the Pet Shop Boys. And you can certainly tell that Depeche Mode are one of Camouflage's primary influences and many times over their career I've heard hints of Depeche Mode sounding similarities popping up in their music from say the Black Celebration period through to Ultra. And indeed, I guess Grayscale may be regarded as Camouflage's homage to their original synthesizer, Heavy Pop Sound, which dips into every style that they have dabbled with over their entire career. I think this is a great album and well worth checking out if you haven't heard of them before. In addition, there's an, as an introduction to Camouflage, there's a really good Camouflage singles compilation album available, which spans their entire career. Give Grayscale a spin and tell us what you think. I think it's a great album, and if you never heard them, I think you'll enjoy it. This is the world where we have to live. There's so much that we have to give. We gonna shine, shine, shine within our minds. Shine from the inside. So I hope you enjoyed our second part interview with Rusty, um, that you really like the Hot Stuff albums that you recommended, I'd say definitely check them all out. They're all brilliant in this particular episode. Um, super loving all the albums that Mark and I have selected for you. Um, and thirdly, um, just take care of yourselves. And say if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do so. If you love electronic music, this is the channel for you. We've got some great content coming up for this year and big things planned for next year. So um, for those who have subscribed from, from the beginning to now, thank you so much. We so appreciate it. We've got an amazing community on our Facebook page. If you want to come and be part of that, please join us. And uh, Mark and I look forward to seeing you all again soon uh, on a new episode of the Electronic Cafe. Stay safe. Bye bye for now. Thanks again for watching the Electronic Cafe and for your continued support. Please subscribe and see you next time. Take care.